Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thank you for joining us for today's Epilepsy Expert webinar. My name is Russ Derry. I'm the Pediatric Epilepsy Program Coordinator at Mott Children's Hospital. And our presentation today is entitled Understanding EEG, a practical guide for patients and families. And we're very pleased to have with us as our guest speaker, Dr. Carrie Neville. Uh, Dr. Neville is a pediatric epileptologist and the medical director of pediatric clinical neurophysiology at Mott Children's Hospital. Um, so I encourage you um, to stay, keep yourself muted during the presentation. If you do have questions, um, you can feel free to, or, or comments, uh, feel free to enter those in the chat. Uh, and we will address any questions um, in the last 15 minutes or so of the, of the session. Um, at that point, too, if you do have questions uh, during the Q&A portion, uh, you can feel free to unmute yourself and ask any questions that you may have. Um, so with that, I will hand it over to Dr. Neville. Thank you, Russ. I'm excited to be here today to talk to you guys about one of my favorite topics is uh, understanding the EEG. What is it that we're looking at when we get an EEG? What do these reports mean um, afterwards that you might see and just kind of walk through some EEG basics. So for an agenda for today or an outline, um, this is how I broke up our discussion. So first we'll talk about uh, Squiggly Lines 101, just an intro to the actual EEG tracing itself, taking a look at the EEG report, what do all these technical words mean? some limitations of EEG, what can and can't an EEG tell us, what questions can it answer, and then what can we do with this information moving forward. So to start with, what is an EEG? EEG stands for electroencephalogram, which is a bit of a mouthful, but just keep in mind whenever you see this um, word en encephalo or encephal, it is referring to the brain. So it's measuring the electrical activity of the brain. And often we're getting EEGs and recording seizures. So it can definitely show us a seizure, which is an abnormal burst of electrical activity. I think of it as too much or too synchronous electrical activity. But it can also tell us some really helpful and important information about the brain waves and the brain activity in between seizures too. And so what are we measuring when we're looking at an EEG. What is it that we're actually recording and looking at? So we said it's the electrical activity of the brain. And this is a, a schematic where at the top, you have your EEG electrodes uh, on the surface of the um, scalp on your skin. And so it's showing you that um, these EEG electrodes are picking up signals way down here at the level of the brain's cells called neurons. Um, so this is the electrical activity down here in the brain tissue from these cells that it's measuring. So the EEG is recording through the skin, the skull and bone, the lining of the brain, the normal fluid filled spaces of the brain or, or the fluid that the brain is bathed in. There's blood vessels coursing through here. And then this is the actual brain tissue itself with the brain cells we're recording the electrical activity of. So that's kind of a schematic of, of the idea behind what, what it is we're measuring. So now let's take a look at some EEG and see if we can start to understand what this readout is that we get when we have the patient hooked up to EEG with those electrodes. <clears throat> so this is what we call an EEG montage. And that's just referring to the stickers, the electrodes we place on the skull. Uh, where are they? and um, what are they recording? So this is our most typical montage or the darker circles um, is where we place the electrodes. So these are all the places you could place an electrode on the scalp, but the, the most standard typical way we set it up is with the ones in these dark black circles. And so what, you're, what this picture is, is you're standing at the head of the bed with the person laying down in front of you. So this is their left ear you can see, hopefully you can see my cursor, left ear and right ear. And the left side is uh, odd numbers just by convention and the right side is even numbers. And so what we're looking at is front to back, left to right. 
So that's how we put the, the stickers or electrodes on the head. And then that's how we um, look at the EEG. So again, front to back, left to right. So the top of the screen is the left side of the brain. The bottom of the screen is the right side of the brain. The letters are the parts of the brain we're looking at. So F for the frontal part, O for occipital or the back part. So left over right, and then looking front to back. Each of these black vertical lines is about a second. So this is one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. 13 seconds, a little over 13 seconds of an EEG is what we're looking at on one page. And this is an example of just a normal awake background, what the brain waves look like when someone's just laying there awake, relaxed, uh, and this is the normal background. And what are we looking at when we're looking at these waves? Well, we're looking at how fast are the waves, how tall are the waves, and then the shape of them or how spiky are they? Um, so how fast is meaning the frequency, how many, going back, how many of these waves are there in a second? And so you can actually sit here and count one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 11 to 12 waves in this one second period, for example. And you may notice you can see this most well formed, it's easiest to count in the O, leads, which is the occipital or back of the brain. So you have this nice 11 hertz wave. Um, so 11 waves per second in the back of the brain. That's normal. That's what we call the alpha frequency. And then there can be other, the, some of the waves are faster than that. And those are we call beta frequencies when they're faster than that. Um, or if they're slower, we break it up into theta slowing or delta slowing. So again, look at how fast are the waves, how tall are the waves, meaning the amplitude of the waves, and then how spiky or sharp are the waves. Going back to our example, there's no spikes or sharps on this wave or on this page. Um, and then the amplitudes, what one thing we do is we look at the left sides, the top of the screen, compared to the right side, the bottom of the screen, and it's very symmetric. The height of all the waves are, are pretty equal overall comparing the left to the right. Um, so that's kind of, you know, 101 squiggly lines. What are we looking at when someone's just awake, relaxed, and we're recording their brain waves? To show you examples of all these, I just had one page, a cartoon illustration. These are those faster waves, those beta waves, where it's just really, really, really fast activity. You can't, it's almost hard, you can't even sit and count how many waves there are here. They're just so fast. There's that alpha frequency we were counting on our example, which is the nice normal awake pattern in the back of the brain. Here's some slower waves, theta range slowing, and then even slower are the delta range. And then the shape of the waves, when I'm talking about spikes or sharps, we literally mean something that looks sharp and spiky, like it would be, it would hurt to sit on it or touch it. It's, it's pokey and pointy, so the shape of it is different. These are abnormal findings, these sharps and spike waves, and we'll see more examples of those. <laughs> so again, just looking at our awake, relaxed EEG background, and then we look at uh, what the waves look like as a patient's falling asleep. And we know what normal is supposed to be for those different stages of sleep. As someone gets drowsy and then falls asleep and then goes into deeper stages of sleep, your EEG background changes normally. So these are some normal examples of different sleep states. Uh, coming up in a minute. First, what we often do is some activation procedures, such as photic stimulation, which is the flashing light test. This is a normal response to photic stimulation. So here we have the lights flashing six times per second. And what happens is you see in these occipital or the back of the brain leads, the waves kind of match the frequency of the flashing light. That's normal. That's a normal photic response. It's our brain interpreting those flashing lights in a normal way. But the reason we do the flashing light test is because sometimes an EEG can otherwise look normal, but during the flashing lights, you start to see things that look too sharp and too spiky. So these are those abnormal waveforms, abnormal electrical activity that can show up 
sometimes only when we do the photic stimulation or particularly when we do the photic stimulation. So that's why we do that flashing light test to see if someone is sensitive to flashing lights either causing seizures or even if they're not seizures, the background markers that show that they're at increased risk for seizures, too much electrical activity at the time of the flashing lights. The other thing we often do during EEG is hyperventilation. So for really young kids, we have them blow on a pinwheel or for older kids, uh, just taking really deep breaths for about two minutes. And this looks quite different than our awake background. It's much slower. So if we sit and count, we see one, two, three waves. So that's that delta wave slowing, three to four waves per second, much slower. But again, this is normal. This is what our brain does uh, or can do when we're hyperventilating. It slows down. And importantly, it slows down the same amount everywhere. It's not that the left side of the brain is slowing down more than the right side of the brain, which is one thing you could look at. There's no spikes or sharps in here, um, which is another thing we're looking for. So this is a normal response to the hyperventilation or the deep breathing exercise. So now, again, comparing that to our awake background, we can look at different stages of sleep. So what do our brain waves look like normally when we're falling asleep? When we get drowsy, one thing you might notice is things just get a little calmer. Um, so going back here, we have things that are, um, these are, we'll talk about this more later, but eye blink artifacts and some muscle artifacts. Um, we have this nice pattern over here, but there's kind of a mix of a lot of things going on. And then as you start to fall asleep, things just kind of calm down a little bit, get quieter. You're no longer, the patient's no longer blinking, their eyes are closed. And then we actually see this really slow undulating pattern, if you can appreciate that, which are the roving eye movements you can have as you're getting drowsy and falling asleep. And then as you fall asleep, you have some different brain waves and some even look kind of sharp and spiky, but it's actually just normal sleep. So we, we have well-defined you know, uh, examples and criteria of what normal sleep waves look like and they look very different than when you're awake. And then, in, and then here's another uh, deeper stage of sleep that we call slow wave sleep. So after you've been asleep for a little bit and are cycling through those deeper stages of sleep, the background gets really slow, but again, it's all normal. These are normal sleep patterns. And then interestingly, when you're in REM sleep, so the rapid eye movements of sleep, the kind of deepest stage of sleep, the EEG starts actually looking more like your awake EEG um, or maybe your drowsy EEG. And these kind of bigger, almost, almost spiky looking things um, in some of these leads are your eye movements. So that's the rapid eye movements of REM sleep, of deep sleep. So we've kind of buzzed through what normal background brain waves can look like when you are just laying relaxed, when you have the flashing lights, when you're doing deep breathing exercises, and then the different stages of sleep. So now just a few examples of the abnormal things that we are looking for on an EEG. And often the kind of primary thing we're looking for is uh, things that show that you're at increased risk for seizures or things that are a marker that you have epilepsy or a marker of your epilepsy. Um, so when we use the term epileptiform, epileptiform just means anything that confers, anything that means you might have an increased risk for seizures. So these are the findings that suggest that there's too much electrical activity and there's a risk that electrical activity could form a seizure. It's not a seizure in and of itself. It's just a marker that you're at risk. And the most common epileptiform abnormalities are spike waves or sharp waves. Spikes and sharps are really the same thing. It's just how fast are they? Spikes are a little bit faster than sharp waves. So on this page here, we have an example of a spike. And if we think back to our montage and just kind of our, our standard naming convention. Um, we have This is on the left side because it's the odd numbers. And the F is the frontal lobe. So the spike here is best form or best seen in the left frontal region. So you have this marker of abnormal electrical activity and a risk for seizures, particularly coming from the left frontal area. The right frontal area looks 
more normal in comparison, not, not as sharp and spiky. Um, and then the other leads, temporal or occipital or just the other regions of the brain don't have that same prominent spike wave to it. Here's another example of spikes or sharps on an EEG. So <laughs> going back to our um, just kind of whole EEG example, the way we're often looking at it as we're reading the EEGs as epilepsy doctors. And I'll, what's written down here are all the examples of sharp waves. This patient is sleeping. I can tell by how the um, waves are organized and how slow they are. Um, so in sleep, on this right side now, in the right temporal region, so kind of the right side of the brain, um, over here if you can see me on video as well, um, every second or two, there's a spike here, or sorry, a sharp here, a sharp here, one here, 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 and here. So for this patient, when they fell asleep, they have much more frequent sharp waves. Again, this is not a seizure actually, um, but very frequent signs that there's some increased electrical activity, too much electrical activity, particularly on the right side of the brain. And that's uh, where seizures could be coming from. This is an example of spike waves that have turned into a seizure, essentially. So a seizure is when the spike waves are organized enough and coming fast enough for a long enough period of time that they're actually causing clinical symptoms. It is also possible to have a seizure just on the EEG without any clinical symptoms at all, but there's other kind of specific criteria for that. Um, but this is one of the, the more common types of seizures in kids called absent seizures. Uh, and this is what the EEG looks like during an absent seizure or a seizure where someone just kind of suddenly stops and stares. So the first few seconds are the normal background on the EEG. And then you see that spike wave, but you see that the spike waves just keep coming. Very rhythmic is one of the keys. It has a very rhythmic pattern to it. Um, this is actually three waves per second. If you kind of turned it down to actually be able, if you kind of lowered uh, the amplitudes or how tall this, the waves are, you could see that it's three waves per second lasting for several seconds. And we make notes on the EEG while we're reading about what happens. Um, when we watch the video, like what, what clinical symptoms does the patient have at the same time? And for this seizure, for example, what happened is the patient paused. They had a clear change in their behavior where they suddenly stopped and paused right at the same time the brain started making the spike wave pattern lasting for, I think it ends up being close to like 10 to 15 seconds. Um, this is just the first part of the seizure I, I took a picture of for you guys. Um, and then it ends and then the, the patient kind of alerts and goes back to their normal self. And so that's what the seizure looks, one example of a seizure on an EEG where those spike waves kind of come too fast, too frequently in this very rhythmic pattern causing clinical symptoms. And that's what a seizure is. So that was my squiggly line 101. Um, so now let's look at the EEG report. So now when I'm done reading the EEG, I try to summarize all of that into um, a written report of what I'm seeing. And this is an example of um, what the EEG report might look like. It'll be much shorter if there's not as many abnormalities to it. Um, but just to kind of give you a sense of when you get an EEG report, what are all these words meaning and, and how is this structured? So that we actually have a method to our madness a bit when we are writing an EEG report. So when First, we describe the background of the EEG, which is kind of what I started to do with you guys too. When the patient's laying there just awake and relaxed, what do those squiggly lines and waves look like? Um, do they have a normal rhythm, a normal organization to it? Is there any asymmetry? Like does the left side look different or worse than the right side, for example? Um, so the first like paragraph or couple sentences usually is just describing that background waveforms. When you first you know, open it up, what does it look like? And then oftentimes after that is where we put any of the abnormal findings, particularly those epileptiform findings, things that mean you are increased risk for seizures, like the spikes and the sharp waves. So after we describe the background, we describe what stands out from the background as abnormal. 
And where are those spikes and sharps located? So we can maybe list some examples of the locations we see them and maybe describe them a little bit. We'll talk about those activation procedures I mentioned, like the flashing lights, which is the photic stimulation, or the hyperventilation, which is the deep breathing that often comes next in the report. And we almost always include a single lead EKG measuring the heart rhythm at the same time and make a little note or comment about that as well. So that's the first part of the report is that really technical description of, of trying to put into words what it is we're seeing on the EEG. This is really written in a way that it's supposed to be helpful to other epilepsy doctors. So maybe not even other neurologists fully understand all of this. Certainly not other doctors who have other specialties may understand all of this. This is really how epilepsy doctors communicate to each other what those brain waves looks like to us. And same thing with the interpretation section. So like the little summary at the bottom, when we're done describing everything in more detail, we try to give a little summary at the bottom. And again, that first part is really geared towards other epilepsy doctors specifically, uh, maybe not even um, doctors of other fields, but really the epilepsy doctors, what do they want to know? Where are those spikes coming from? What do they look like? What does the background look like? So that if they get their own EEG down the road, they can kind of have a, a picture in their head of what you were looking at and compare it. What you're probably most interested in as the patient or the family member is the clinical correlate. And it's still written more mostly in doctor speak. It's still not the most friendly of languages when you're trying to interpret this EEG report. Like, what does this mean in English? And that's where your doctor and, and epilepsy doctor and neurologist can come in and help interpret it for you. Um, but the clinical correlation is probably the thing that um, you might want to pay the most attention to, or you might kind of want to have some basic understanding of. We almost always start with a sentence, is it normal or abnormal? Was the patient awake or asleep? And what did that background look like again? Was the background normal or was there some waves that looked too slow? And after we describe the background, we describe those, what stands out from the background? Was there anything epileptiform, anything that increases the risk for seizures, particularly those sharps or spikes? And that's exactly what this is describing here. So that's a little um, kind of biopsy of the written EEG report. Uh, but again, it's written quite technically in like quite technical language. And so it can be a little bit challenging to interpret. Um, but again, most importantly, is we try to include a line here that says, you know, does this mean that there's increased risk for seizures? Yes or no. <clears throat> so the EEG can give us a lot of information. I kind of just scratched the surface of all that an EEG can tell us. And we can take a deeper dive into any aspect of that that you guys want during the question and answer portion. Um, but there's a lot of things the EEG cannot tell us too. And we need to keep that in mind when we get these um, results um, or when we get these tests. And so like any medical test, there's limitations to it. And the most important thing is what the patient is experiencing and describing. And so clinically, what are the symptoms? And that really um, helps guide how we interpret the, these results. Because a normal EEG does not rule out epilepsy. It can make it um, less likely that maybe an event is a seizure if you don't see any of those abnormalities. Um, but people who have known, documented, definite epilepsy could certainly have a, a portion of their EEG look completely normal. And part of this depends on how long of the tests that we're getting. So for what we call our routine EEGs, they're often only about 30 to 60 minutes. And someone with clear epilepsy could certainly go for 30 to 60 minutes without those background abnormalities. A lot of people who have epilepsy though, most people who have epilepsy will have some sort of marker or abnormality in the background in that 30 to 60 minute time frame, which is why it makes it a good screening test. It's a good initial test to check and see what do those brainwaves look like? How, how can we, um, estimate the risk of more seizures, but even if it's normal, particularly if it's only 30 minutes or so, it does not necessarily rule out epilepsy as a possibility. And then conversely, an abnormal EEG does not automatically mean you have epilepsy. People can have even spikes or sharps, those epileptiform discharges that suggest you're at risk for seizures. You, it's possible to have that on your EEG, but never actually have a clinical seizure. So we never want to, almost never, 
Uh, there's rare exceptions, but we are often not treating the EEG alone, but we're treating the EEG and more importantly, the clinical symptoms that that patient has. So why are there these limitations to the EEG? Um, what would make it normal in someone who has epilepsy? What would make it abnormal in someone who doesn't have epilepsy? What makes it hard to interpret? So first of all, there can be several different artifacts um, on the EEG. And we have to keep in mind how, how we started the, the discussion is, what is the EEG even measuring? So it's measuring the electrical activity way out here on the scalp, but it's trying to record something that's way down here in the brain. So depending on where in the brain this electrical activity is, it's possible to miss something up here on the surface the EEG. Or the abnormal electrical activity is infrequent enough that you're just not capturing it during the time period you have the EEG leads on. Um, or you can get different artifacts because something is interfering with the signal going from down here all the way up to your electrode at the top. Uh, things that can interfere with that are um, if there's any skull defects, if there's extra fluid, if um, there's a blood vessel that is uh, pulsing, you can see some artifact on the EEG, for example, which is uh, kind of a unique, fun example I'll show you in one of our pictures. Um, so there are some limitations just based on what we're recording and where we're recording from and how long we're recording for. Another example is even if someone has a seizure with the electrodes on, um, that's usually very helpful. That's kind of the gold standard to diagnose a seizure and epilepsy is that the um, patient has a seizure while the electrodes are on and the EEG is running and then we can see that electrical activity on the EEG during the seizure. And that can give us some really helpful information about what type of seizure it might be or where it might be coming from. But in some cases, in rare cases, it is possible that even during a seizure, you might not see changes on the EEG. And why would that be? Well, the brain is this big pink wrinkly mass, right? Is what we think of when we think of a brain. So it has all these folds and crevices in it. And then if you look kind of even deeper into the middle parts of the brain, this is kind of the brain cut in half, the folds and crevices go way down deep, not just on the surface, but down deep here too. And if there's a seizure that stays really tiny and really small and only affects this deep, small fold, the electrical signal might not get all the way up to our surface EEG electrodes to see them. So there can be limitations with that too. And that's why clinically understanding what it is that you or the patient experiences or what it is that you see is so important and so helpful as we're interpreting the EEG. So these are a couple of the artifacts that I mentioned, just to go back to some picture examples. Um, and so what might stand out on this page is these big waves at the top of each of these channels. So these are the F leads. You've got these big, sharper deflections that are only in the frontal leads. And those are actually eye blinks because our eyeballs also have an electrical field to them. And every time we blink, our eyes roll up. And so that shows up on the EEG as an eye blink artifact. And we just know what this looks like. We are used to looking at EEGs and we kind of just filter this through in our heads and just know that this is normal. These are eye blinks. And then the rest of the background looks normal as well. Here's an example of pulse artifact I was talking about. Um, so this is a little bit of a quieter EEG. I think the patient's probably sleeping, um, might even be in the hospital for other reasons uh, and have some sedation, um, sedating medications on board. But what you can see is you start getting this rhythmic, almost sharp looking pattern to it. And sometimes things that are rhythmic and sharp are actually seizures. But what we know, because we have this EKG, this heart rhythm, down here is that it matches up perfectly with the heartbeat. So this is actually just an artifact that EEG electrode sitting on the skin is picking up the, the blood pulsing through the blood vessels. So just another example 
of things that we have to watch out for is the EEG reader that can be artifacts um, of just how the EEG is recorded. So one thing we do if we see something like this is we try to, to maybe reposition the head and see if we can get that to go away. Um, but we can see that it lines up with that heart rate. And so this is not abnormal, actually. Uh, it's a normal finding. Um, that's just an artifact of how the EEG is being recorded. Doesn't mean that someone's at, having a seizure or at increased risk for seizure. All right. So I just went through kind of all the limitations of an EEG, and again, it makes it sound like, well, what good is this test then? Um, but again, lots of information we can learn from an EEG, even uh, outside the setting of a seizure, even just getting those baseline waveforms and looking at what that background looks like. Are there any background abnormalities, little markers or buzzes of abnormal activity? One thing we can do with that information is, is the EEG is critical components, that initial diagnosis of epilepsy. So someone has their first seizure of life or a single event that could be a seizure, but could also be a fainting spell, could be an abnormal movement for another reason. Um, and we're trying to answer that initial question, was this first episode that somebody had a seizure or not? Yes or no. So we look at the background of the, and we look for any of those epileptiform spikes or sharps or signs. That they have too much electrical activity that put them at further risk. And if they do have markers of more of further risks for more seizures on their EEG and have a clinical event that sounds very much like a seizure, well, then that helps us diagnose epilepsy and perhaps diagnose it um, on the early side so we can start medications and prevent more seizures from happening. So we've confirmed that based on the story, yes, this sounds like a seizure. Based on the EEG, there's risk for more seizures. So it's epilepsy, we wanna start a medication, we wanna prevent seizures and keep the patient safe. It can also tell us, or give us some clues at least, what kind of epilepsy or what kind of seizure is the patient having? Is it focal, meaning that there's only one area, like that right temporal or right frontal area that has those sharps and spikes? Meaning seizures are coming from maybe just that area and then spreading? Or is it a generalized seizure, like we saw with that three hertz spike wave from the absence seizure, where it's the whole brain all at once, having a spike coming from everywhere all at once, a generalized seizure. Uh, and that can help diagnose and provide different um, treatment options for patients. Sometimes we get follow-up EEGs after our initial diagnosis of epilepsy, we start a medication and depending on the kind of epilepsy, the response to treatment, what else is going on at the time, on at the time, well, you might repeat an EEG at certain intervals. And it's very individualized to the patient how often um, we do that. Uh, but it can, so the EEGs can also help tell us, has there been a response to medications? Has it been helpful? Um, obviously, imp more importantly is, does the, the patient feel better? Are there fewer seizures? Um, do they feel better overall, making sure they don't have side effects or as few side effects as possible? Uh, but we can also use the EEG to help guide us too. Does the EEG seem um, more active, less active? Are there any subtle seizures on the EEG only that we're not seeing now that we're partially treating with medications? And then another thing the EEG can tell us that I've kind of alluded to a couple of times now is where might the seizures be coming from? So if they are focal seizures coming from one area of the brain first and then spreading, what is that area that they're coming from? which can be really important to know if medications just aren't helping anymore um, or are not controlling the seizures and we can find where the seizure is coming from, then there's the possibility that you could even remove that area of the brain that's not really doing much else but causing trouble and causing seizures. So can we find where the seizures are coming from and would it be safe to remove that area? And in that case, you could... Uh, essentially cure the epilepsy. So the EEG is very, very valuable for that kind of question as well. So going back to our example, this was <laughs> the frequent spikes, or sorry, frequent sharps in that right temporal area when this patient fell asleep. And the very focal stayed right in that right temporal region. And so what we might do in that case is if the patient's still having seizures despite good medication trials, is see what's going on in this area with imaging, for example. So this is an MRI of the brain. 
and it's a pretty subtle finding. So bear with me. You kind of have to, to trust me a little bit, but the deep right part of the brain here. Um, so this is the right side of the brain, the left side of the brain. This is that temporal lobe I was talking about. And then the deepest part of that temporal lobe on the right, it's a little bigger, a little chunkier and a little brighter compared to the left side. And you might not notice that at first, uh, even a well-trained uh, medical eye might not notice at first that there's that asymmetry, but it matches up really nicely with that EEG finding. And then there's even more specialized imaging we can get where we're like, huh, that looks a little different comparing the left and the right. I'm not really sure what that means or what to make of that, but there's other imaging tests that we could do to see if that asymmetry is real. For example, a PET scan. And here we see there's a, a much bigger difference on the right side of the brain in that same temporal lobe compared to the left side of the brain. The PET scan is actually measuring um, the metabolism of the brain, the energy of the brain, and how it's taking up sugar or glucose. In this area here, is taking up less sugar, less glucose. It matches with the area here on the MRI that looks a little chunkier and a little brighter. And most importantly for us, matches up with that EEG on the right temporal area that shows too much electrical activity. So now you have an area of the brain with all of this um, testing that's lining up. Too much electrical activity, too big and bright, not enough glucose uptake, all from the same area, which points to where the seizures are coming from. Um, and if we can find that this is a safe area of the brain to remove, then we can treat the seizures that way as well. So that localizing information from the EEG can be very, very valuable. So that was my attempt to summarize uh, a year of epilepsy uh, training in one um, brief session. So I kind of uh, picked and choose a little bit what I talked about today. So I would love to hear from you guys what questions you have, what you might want to learn more about, what you might want to talk further about, um, and we can go from there. Thank you, Dr. Neville. That was fascinating. And uh, I know one of the participants and I were talking about, okay, we, we took the uh, Squiggly Lines 101 course. Let's take the 102 course now. <laughs> We want to learn more. Um, so who, who uh, would like to get us started with, with a question? You can just un unmute yourself or you can also feel free to type that into the chat. Does anyone have a question? Oh, this is Kathy, Catherine. Am I on? Yep. Oh, hi there. Hi there. Hi. Um, thank you so much. This was I'm just taking it all in and jotting down notes rapidly. And um, this was this was great. And you brought up the clinical context is important. And like my question, I guess, is if I see like when my daughter is getting an EEG, I can see something a real subtle, um, like a lip quivering. And I'll push the little button and I'll give the description and it may or may not show up on the, on the squiggly line. That's the confusing part to me, or if she's like zoning out. So can you run by that again? Like if it's a real, is there a difference on the EEG from like a real you know, seizure where your hands fly up and you can, and the person is actually, you know, you can actually see it. And when someone's zoning out or like just a little bit of a lip or tongue quiver, is it, does that show like on the EEG, like you can definitely see, oh, this is like a really big one, or this is like a person zoning out. Is that real clear? So let's go all the way back actually to this example. So Here's the, the kind of prototypical example of a clear seizure on an EEG, right? Like you can see this from across the room. There's clearly a change on the EEG from this first few seconds that are normal and then this high amplitude, big spiky waves right. that are just coming so fast and so frequent. Um, 
So this is like really scary looking, right? Like this is really big and obvious and scary looking, but mm -hmm. clinically it's stopping and staring, maybe some lip smacking and pausing. Okay. Okay. So it depends on where the seizure is coming from a little bit and what type of seizure it is. So this is an example of a generalized seizure that the clinical correlate might be quite subtle, but very clearly the whole brain is involved in this electrical activity all at once. Um, I picked this because it's, it's kind of our kind of bread and butter example, what a very common example, very easy to see example. Um, but then there's a huge range, right? From this to a small focal seizure that can also be quite subtle. And maybe that, for example, is, um, trying to think of a, a good example, like we sometimes call it a seizure aura, like the sensation that a patient has right before a bigger seizure. Yeah. They're actually, those are actually seizures. They're just staying so small in such a like um, specific area and not spreading that all they have is kind of that warning sign. And that you might just see a normal background. Um, uh -huh. Then you might have um, what looks to be a big seizure, um, but the spike wave pattern might not be as dramatic as this, but it's certainly very clearly different than the background. Um, maybe not to make you dizzy, but going back to this. So this is, this could be pretty close to a seizure. The reason this one's not a seizure is it's just a little too slow. And there's like a second or two in between these okay. sharps. Mm -hmm. um, there's no clinical correlate with it. Um, and it, it doesn't really change over time. A seizure on an EEG will change. We use the word evolve, um, meaning that it will spread. Maybe it will start here and then start spreading into these other leads, or it will get faster and slower, or these sharps will start taking on a more spiky appearance or a different shape. Um, so those are all the different ways a seizure in particular can show up on an EEG and, and how scary and bad it looks on the EEG doesn't always match how severe the symptoms are for the patient, but a lot of times it does too. Okay. So when I see something, when she's all hooked up to these electrodes, when, when I do see something, it's important for me to mark that then yes. and not disregard it because it's all, okay. If you, if you are worried that could be part of her seizure presentation, it's very important to mark it um, because especially if it's something subtle, right? Like it would be impossible to just like watch it in real time and find it uh, without, you know, being alert. Like here's, here's the time where she did something really subtle. Let's look really closely at the brainwaves here and see if there's any correlate. Okay. All right. Thank you. And one more question. And this is silly, but is there a difference between a spike and a sharp or is... That's a good question. <laughs> it's something that kind of annoyed me when I was learning to read EEGs at first. Like, <laughs> not not really. Like, someone just made the definition that a spike is less than 200 microseconds long and a sharp is more than 200 microseconds long. But, like, uh. what that means for, like, the person and the patient and the treatment, like, it really doesn't matter. Uh, <laughs> okay. It's more of a description of the shape. And so it might matter in terms of, like, you describing it to other, like, epilepsy doctors, and then they can picture the EEG. Um, so it's describing the shape, but like clinically, what does that mean? It doesn't make a big difference. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. I have I, one. I, go ahead. Um, the area on the PET scan that was kind of chunky. Yeah. And you said something about the glucose uptake of that area. I, I'm, what does that, what does the glucose have to do with the epilepsy? Oh, good question. Yeah. So um, I kind of buzzed by that a little bit. Um, so I didn't want to get too off topic, but uh, it's a good question because um, so what, what the PET scan is doing is it is when someone's not having a seizure, just at their baseline, but they have a history of epilepsy and we're trying to figure out where their seizures might be coming from. We look at just the resting metabolic state of the brain. That's what the PET scan is. So it's looking at um the brain needs a lot of energy just to do its normal daily functioning. Uh, and it gets that energy from glucose, from sugar. And so the red in the PET scan is the normal, normal activity of the brain, taking up lots of sugar and doing its normal thing. Even when it's resting, it needs lots of energy, lots of glucose, even for that resting state. And that's what the, the dark red is. Um, 
in an area where seizures are coming from, you might see that it's the brain's just not as active there, even at its resting state. It's not um, participating as much as that normal baseline rest activity. It's not taking up as much glucose. So it's a clue that there could be something going on there, um, meaning that could be where seizures are coming from. Um, so hopefully I explained that in a way that makes yeah. a bit more sense. Absolutely. Um, it doesn't always work. Like this is one of the best examples. I picked like the best example I could find. Sometimes people with epilepsy have a completely normal PET scan too. Uh, but the PET in particular is good for these temporal lobes. If seizures are coming from there, they're just kind of quieter in their like resting state. They're just not as metabolically active. And then you see that um, light up on the PET scan. Hi, Dr. Neville. This is Renee Roderer from the Epilepsy Foundation of Michigan. And this is really fascinating. It was fun to see those things and have you interpret them. I'm curious, uh, I, obviously EEGs themselves last different periods of time, but like for a standard EEG um, that isn't, pro, you know, like a extended period of time, like how long does it take you to read one? And um, also, are there tools... I don't know, machine learning or anything that sort of helps spot some of these things. I'm just curious. Thank you. Yeah, definitely. Um, how long it takes definitely depends on the EEG. Like a normal 30 minute EEG might only take a few minutes to read. Um, sometimes the normal ones take a bit longer though, if you're trying to make sure that like, is this just a normal artifact? Is this just, you know, because the range of normal can be quite wide and you want to make sure you're not over interpreting, calling something abnormal when it's not or missing something. Um, but like a, a really kind of classic awake, resting EEG for only 30 minutes might only take a couple of minutes for to read. Um, if you have one that's like a couple hours, uh, and is quite abnormal and you're looking, you know, at a couple events that could take easily an hour to read. And then when we do our overnight EEGs and we're looking at maybe up to 24 hours of EEG data at a time, we're often, so like, for example, when I am working in the hospital and I'm reading overnight EEGs, um, and I usually I'm looking at a 12 hour chunk of period when I come in in the morning, like I'm trying to catch up from the previous day and all overnight. So if I'm looking at like a 12 hour chunk, I would say it takes me at least a half an hour per patient to look at that 12 hour chunk. Um, but then obviously much longer for things that maybe are abnormal or have seizures or have um, events that people have noted with a push button. Um, so it's a big range. And then, oh, the other part of your question, the machine learning piece. Yes, there's software that helps uh, identify some of those sharps and spikes, for example, or it could help identify asymmetry um, and kind of pull that out. Um, it's not perfect by any means. Um, it can be a helpful tool. I always read the EEG first on my own with my own eyes, every page of it. Um, and I can go quite fast at times, uh, but I do scan through every page of the whole EEG with my own eyes without filtering it or using the kind of machine programming. But then if I have a particular question or a particular area, or I want to like double check a specific question, then I can use some of those software tools that maybe will try to highlight a spike in sharp wave. Sometimes they accidentally include things like normal sleep, especially in little kids. Um, so those soft, a lot of the software has been developed using adult examples and adult patients and little kids, EEGs and brains can just be so different. And the range of what's normal for a kid might be very different. Um, but often overcalls things in younger children, for example, um, but can still be a helpful tool. Great. Any other questions? Well, I have, while people are thinking, I have a question um, about, uh, can you talk a little bit about uh, non-epileptic events or psychogenic non-epileptic seizures and uh, the fact that um, you talked about the limitations of EEG and that sometimes you can have a clinical seizure, but because it's so deep in the brain, it's not captured um, by the scalp EEG. And uh, I would imagine that some with less training in epilepsy, maybe their their knee jerk reaction may be maybe to assume that that is non epileptic seizures or or PNES as it's also called. Um, 
but how, how do you how how do how does an epileptologist make that distinction? Is it largely based on clinical symptoms? Are there other ways to identify abnormalities that may not be showing up on a on a scalp EEG? Yeah, good question. Um, I think the the biggest tool or help we have with that is having the video EEG at the same time, having the video to correlate um, with uh, the EEG tracing in real time so that we can see um, as the patient's symptoms progress and develop clinically, like what we can see by watching the video, um, how does the EEG look? And so there are certain clinical patterns that we just know will show up on a surface EEG, even given the limitations of it. So if someone is having bilateral rhythmic jerking tonic clonic movements, for example, you won't miss that on a surface EEG. So if your surface EEG is completely normal, you know, minus maybe some movement or muscle artifact during the time someone's having bilateral right and left sided rhythmic jerking, then it it's much we much more confident that this is a non-epileptic seizure. It's not coming from the electrical activity in the brain um, based on our EEG, but some something else that's triggering the patient to have these movements. Um, and that's what we call it psychogenic non-epileptic seizures or spells. There's lots of names for it. What gets trickier is if the symptoms that the patient's having are more um, uh, specific, um, maybe more subtle. And so then the question might remain, is it just staying in this, you know, small, deep area um, to cause some of those subtle symptoms? Um, some clues are like if the symptoms clinically are worsening, you know, they might start with just, you know, a funny sensation or might start with like some staring off and lip smacking, um, but then they progress to bigger and bigger symptoms. And we're not seeing that on the EEG still. We're not seeing the electrical activity on the EEG. Um that also makes us feel more confident that it's probably all non-epileptic. The caveat, again, what we what we always keep in the back of our minds is if it stays a subtle, smaller looking seizure clinically um, and the EEG stays normal, well, could there still be some abnormal activity that we just can't pick up on? Um, oftentimes, if that's the case, I, if someone has um, epilepsy, uh, that's causing a seizure like that, at some point, the this, this seizure often spreads um, and then we are able to see it. Uh, or some of our medications, we can wean the medications and then see the spread pattern. That can be helpful too. And then we can start seeing it on the, the surface EEG. It'd be fairly atypical to have just uh, a seizure that stays, always stays so small and subtle that you never see anything. So that's why longer EEG recordings can be helpful. We have done it up to like, you know, seven days, for example, or potentially even longer to capture multiple different events and see if it, we can catch a spread pattern at any point on the EEG. Um, and so getting a good description of like the seizure types or event types someone has, one might stay small and focal, maybe you'll never see it on the EEG, but they might have another type of seizure that you are able to detect. Um, and so those are kind of some, some ways we can try to tease that apart a little bit. And then the interictal EEG too. So like, what does the EEG look like when they're not having a seizure, especially if you're doing it for longer, like days at a time, if you're not seeing any of those spikes and sharps for days and days at a time, that can be helpful maybe suggest it's more non-epileptic, or if you see spikes and sharps um, in between the seizures, you might think it's more of an epileptic seizure. Great, thank you. And, and a, kind of a follow-up to that question, because you mentioned interictal, can you talk a little bit more about what we can learn uh, from that from the interictal EEG, from things like slowing, from interictal epileptiform discharges, and and, and not how they influence seizures, but how they can influence cognitive function and other things like talking about things like ESES or um, other background slowing or things like that. What can we learn about um, the impact on behavior or cognitive function uh, from, from that interictal EEG? Yeah, so um, I'll go back. This is probably the best example I have of an inter interictal is just the starting point. So again, this is, this is sleep and it's otherwise pretty normal except for these sharps. But sometimes, um, what we see in the background is that the whole brain just looks a little bit too slow. And so what we describe in the report in those cases is 
maybe an encephalopathy or diffuse cerebral dysfunction are the technical terms we use. And if the whole brain just looks a little bit slow for most of the study um, or has too many of those slower delta theta waves and not as much of those alpha waves we like to see, um, then what that means it, as far as like encephalopathy or diffuse cerebral function might be um, clinically manifested as global developmental delays, um, autism spectrum disorder, those things can kind of go hand in hand. It's not necessarily, you know, one is causing the other, but it's just fits the, the clinical um, picture that the patient presents with as well. Um, yes, yes, is a really interesting topic. Uh, and it is when the, these spikes come out in sleep um, to a degree that is way more than you see them in wakefulness. And if you, even more than maybe what we see on this example, like you would see even more spiking. Um, and then when they're awake, they kind of just disappear. And in some cases that can contribute to either language regression um, or other types of regression. Most classically it's language regression. So if your EEG looks okay when you're awake and then you fall asleep and you just have continuous spiking in the language centers of the brain, um, that's an example where we worry that the EEG spikes are actually causing symptoms. Even though they're not a seizure, it's so much spiking that it's actually contributing to clinical symptoms. It's kind of one of the rare exceptions where we treat the EEG um, because we think that in those cases, the EEG is actually causing some of the clinical symptoms. Uh, that can be really hard to tease out. And again, it's very, very patient specific and dependent, uh, dependent uh, taking the whole clinical picture uh, into consideration. Focal slowing suggests there might be a structural abnormality. Um, so if this wasn't quite so spiky, this would almost be a good example of focal slowing. Um, we can see some of these waves are just much slower on the right compared to the left. So it's possible to have this slowing without the sharper spike. That's an example of focal slowing. And then you definitely want to get an MRI if you see that, because you wonder if there's something structural in the brain, like a tumor uh, or even something much more benign, like an old area of injury or scarring that's causing one area to look slower than another in particular. Thank you. That is so helpful, Dr. Neville. And uh, I know I will be going back and re-watching this in the future just uh because there's it's so complex and and I have to say how, how amazed I am at what you guys are able to detect by scanning quickly over these EEGs. So um, I hope this was helpful for everyone and thank you everyone for joining us and I uh, hope you have a great day.